Good morning, and thank you so much for inviting us to come here. This we consider to be quite a privilege to share about our story. I want to begin by saying, as David shared, my name is Renee Howerton, and I am the director of the Nakatani Teaching and Learning Center at UW-Stout. And as we put together the group of colleagues who would come here, I want you to know that each one of them was intentional and they represent a, a certain uh, discipline and a very important aspect of the journey that led us to your doorstep. So first of all, I wanted to introduce Dr. Virginia Lee. Uh, Virginia, along with Holly Turber, and Holly was not able to join us at the last minute, and she does send her sincere reg uh, regrets for that. She is with us in spirit today. Uh, she, both Virginia and Holly, as you will learn as I go through things, they are, were co-investigators for this project. They bring the knowledge, the expertise about diversity and multiculturalism, and they bring a life of passion about this topic. And I'll tell you how we connected and, and why that is so important as you think about your own journey that you're going to take. Uh, Dr. Ar um, Arthur Nealon, you're going to be hearing him speak via video. Okay, he couldn't be here with us, but he has made a video for us. Dr. Mark Fenton, right there. He is the program director for our business department. If you get a chance to talk with him, he's quite the international traveler, and he's doing all kinds of projects, and you'll find them very fascinating. Dr. Anusa Bubakar is uh, in economics, that is his specialty, and he is in social sciences. I wanted to point that out because as we talk about this, you're going to hear about the wide variety of disciplines uh, that were part of our, different, our various cohorts, and that is important to consider as you think about disciplines who maybe don't traditionally think about infusing diversity. We found creative ways to do that. All right, let's begin. So I think it's always important to have a little bit of history. And of course, this is the part that Holly wanted to share with you. But um, our first seeds of inspiration where we started this was uh, because of a book discussion. And it was one that the NTLC, our learning center, was sponsoring. And they used this book. And it was a fairly large group of faculty members. They read it. They discussed it. And I was just coming on board as director at that time. And one of the things I, I distinctly remember that so impressed me was at the end of the, the book discussion, and, and although they usually only go one semester on our campus, this one went like a couple of semesters. The conversations were very rich. And at the end of them, they made this long list of possible things they could continue to do or that they would like to see occur on our campus relative to infusing diversity. I took that as director, but I didn't know what to do with it. Okay? But about that same time, OPID was advertising that they uh, had a theme which was all about diversity and that they had grant money. All right, so now I had some ideas. And there seemed like an opportunity to get some grant dollars to tie to it. I then had the privilege to hear both Virginia and Holly talk about what they were doing in the classroom and about their life passion relative to multiculturalism. And a light bulb went off for me, and I knew that I had found the advocates. So I invited them to help me write a grant for OPID. We received that grant. I'll tell you a little bit more about it as we go through this. But it was a process, and it was initiated through this book discussion. As we started writing the grant, it was very important to us that we tie it to the mission and the values of Stout. So we looked at the mission because we wanted to see how could we make a connection to what we claim that we stand for at UW-Stout. So we looked at words like humanistic understanding, ethical leaders, and responsible citizens. We looked at our values, which clearly talks about inclusion of everyone. And so we, we felt that um, this was something that had a place, it had a purpose, and uh, we continued with that. We also looked at the enduring, enduring goals of the UW system 
as well as uh, their perspective on inclusive excellence. And you can see it was a, a very good match between what we wanted to do, infuse diversity across the curriculum, and how it related to the enduring goals and inclusive excellence. In addition to that, we thought long and hard about definitions for some words. What does inclusivity look like at Stout? I'm sure much like here that you have numerous organizations that deal with various aspects of diversity. I would imagine that you participated in the equity scorecard and in the climate assessment, okay? So we have done all of those kinds of things and we thought about, well, what has been our journey, our process uh, dealing with inclusivity at UW-Stout and then how does how does that relate to us wanting to bring it into the classroom? Throughout this project, we thought it was very important and understand everything I'm, I'm showing you, it, nothing happened over a short <laughs> period of time. It is the result of many, many hours of conversation. It's many hours of questioning. So through a, this long journey, we finally settled on a definition. Now, this is important for you. Uh, you may not choose Sonia Nieto's definition. We chose it because we felt it was inclusive and that it covered the things that we valued. But I can tell you this, that as you try to communicate with other groups out there, you need to have a common definition. And that's what we, we, we came to really realize, that as we talked with those who uh, did not perhaps have the background, that we had or uh, did not have um, uh, just access to some of the things that we were working at with, materials and that kind of thing. We needed a definition, a place to start with. All right. So now I was asked to share with you the nuts and bolts of this project. Three years we've been working on this project. Now what is significant about that is that when I wrote that initial grant, it wasn't for three years. It was a one year, that's all that was planned. Our funding has come from different sources and somehow we've kept this going. 30 faculty members have either completed the program or they are just about to complete the program as of this May. It's also important that you see the wide diversity of different disciplines who have gone through this because I think it's very encouraging and it, it points out to you that um, disciplines that don't traditionally can think about infusing diversity, that they can do this and they can uh, do it in very creative, very meaningful ways. All right, funding, I told you about OPED. Well, that first cohort, when we um, advertised for um, applications, because people had to be selected to receive the grant money and to uh, go through this process, we were hopeful that we might get six, maybe on a good day, eight applications. We got 18 of them. They were all passionate. They were all clearly stated. And of course, Virginia and Holly, as they worked with me, they looked at me and they said, we can't turn anyone away, Renee. So their solution was, Renee, you'll just have to go find more money. <laughs> all right. So, um, so I went to the provost, I went to the deans, and you, you have to appreciate, I was a pretty brand new director, and I, I was just still, I'm, my mind is boggled that they all said yes. And we were able to support all 18 faculty. And so 17 of those faculty members completed that one year project. Okay. Since then, for two years, we have received funding from the diversity leadership team that is uh, also associated with the chancellor's office. The project was guided by NTLC, but with the magnificent help of Virginia and Holly. Okay, um, as I mentioned now, we, ha we created a model for how to um, guide the cohorts through this. And while there is nothing particularly unique about that, what is unique is that we did it consistently year after year. And when you do that, it becomes stronger, you become clearer in your message of what you're going to give, you become 
um, clear and also what is important to share during your training times. So we came to realize that it was crucial to do a two-day workshop, and we've done that each August. That workshop is so important because if you took time to watch that digital story, one of those faculty members in there told you that his fear was that this was going to be very superficial. By having that two-day training, we were able to make it very clear that, no, this is about deep reflection. This is about an ongoing personal journey for you, as well as your students, throughout the coming year. And so the workshop kicked it off. There was lots of foundational materials and experiences and inner reflection that was all a uh, part of that. Then during fall, they had to commit to meeting on a bi-monthly basis to talk about uh, what kinds of assignments and projects that they would implement in their courses in spring, as well as to develop assessment tools. I want to encourage you, as you think about what you're going to do in the future, you need to document your artifacts. You saw the digital story. That was one example of it. When we created that digital story, we asked them all kinds of questions. We asked them to share their responses to these various questions, such as, why did you want to participate in this project? What were your initial perceptions of this project? And that's where you heard the, the faculty members say he was really afraid it was going to be superficial, but he was so pleased to see it was a much more deeper, enriching, and demanding um, journey. All right. The reason you want to document this is because you will find other campuses, other stakeholders who will be eager to learn from you. And by having this documentation, then you're able to, to not just show them the end results, but the process, that um, inner reflection that people go through. Okay, now what you probably didn't hear about, because you saw the digital story, but during that same semester, I was contacted by this instructor, and he said, I've got students who I'm training in 2D game design, and we're looking for clients. I said, have I got a project for you? How about tackling diversity and making a video game? And I was really, we, we were really strict about, we didn't want them to use stereotype images of females and males and that kind of thing. And instead, they were able to create three characters a rock, a ghost, and a light bulb who go on this incredible journey. Sometimes there is conflict, and then ultimately they learn that they have to compromise and they have to work through the diversities in order to save the world. It's a fascinating video game, and it's accessible on the NTLC website. Another way we documented was through posters, and the first year uh, we had them all do professional posters, and it it documented both their uh, personal reflections as well as student learning outcomes. The second year, we did posters again, but this time it had another special element. Virginia will be talking more about a student project she does in which she has her students work on collages. We took and we had our faculty cohort create personal um, collage. That was a lot of fun. Yes, good. He did it, too. And we were trying to tap into that less conscious, that subconscious reflections that they had. And so you can see some of the things they were asked to do. So imagine Mark, he was cutting out pictures and he was putting words to it and all of that. But it was a way for them to get at those inner feelings, those inner thoughts that they'd had and what they'd learned along uh, this, this process. For 2014, we're doing something slim, uh, similar, excuse me, but it now deals with metaphors. And since Anusa is part of that cohort, he is thinking about what kind of metaphors uh, relate to his thoughts, his experience, what he has learned through this process. What is also unique is this time around, we're asking them to video or audio record their reflections. In addition to documenting it, we have made an intentional effort to celebrate and to disseminate. And that is important, that you build that into whatever you do, that you will um, require, nurture, encourage 
the dissemination so that this spreads forward, so that it gets shared with other faculty members. We've done that in a variety of things, both on campus and off campus, both uh, locally, statewide, nationally, and even internationally. We have um, talked about this at ISOTO in Canada. We have also been the recipient of the Ann Lidecker Educational Award through the UW system. And the, I say that with uh, complete humbleness. We were very fortunate to receive that recognition. The importance of that recognition, though, is, that, again, to expand the stakeholders and the buy-in that you have, and, again, being able to share this. We were also uh, invited and asked to submit for the Board of Regents Diversity Award. We did not receive that award. But again, it's that recognition. And I'm telling you this because there are people who are hungry to see this work. And that's why you want to share it with others. And when you share it, you will probably be asked to apply for awards and grants and all kinds of things. So make sure you celebrate along the way. There's a lot of work. It's important to remember the celebration. In addition to, I told you that um, there was the required individual assessment. So every faculty member had to go in and they had to assess their students so that we could see where the student's getting it. Okay, what kind of evidence did you have? But in addition to that, we also received funding to do overarching assessments. In 2012 and 2013, we used surveys. In 2012, though, by the time we could, we could actually do the overarching and by the time we had the funding for it, we were only able to do a post-survey. Right? In all cases, we worked with Applied Research Center and everything was IRB approved. It was distributed to all students, so I want you to, to understand that we have now um, administered our surveys and all of that to several hundreds of students, and so we have that collective feedback as well. The 2012 survey, it had seven Likert scale questions that it started out with, and then it had five open-ended questions. Right. What is important about this, and in a few moments, I'm, you, if you look at the yellow copy that's on your table, you will see, you can see the Likert um, scale questions, and you can see roughly some of the open-ended ones, especially for 2013. But what I want to point out to you about 2012 that was surprising to us and let us know we were on the right path is look at the level of agreement and strong agreement. So every one of those questions that you see there that was part of the Likert scale, they were responding. Their students were saying this was, this was a, a very positive, very beneficial experience. When we got to the open-ended questions, what we learned that was so important to us was that when you approach a project like this with intentionality, when you come to your class and you tell your students that this semester we're going to talk about certain issues, Okay, and you may either identify them or you may do it very broadly and say diversity. And you say everyone's voice will be heard and everyone is welcomed here. What this, how the students translate that is that they liked the class, they thought it was better, it was more comfortable, they felt more valued and respected. So we, we knew we were on the right path, but we wanted to see if we continue that, would we get the same kind of response? So then in 2013, we used the same seven Likert scale questions, and that's what you have in front of you. But now we wanted to revise the open-ended question because just like um, students grow, we, the cohort, was growing. And we came to realize that we need, needed um, to really sort of dig down deeper. And so we revised, we, we felt we improved the open-ended questions, and that's what you have before you. So uh, again, I'm so glad that David told you that you will have access to the PowerPoint. I know this is a little bit difficult to see, but what I want to point out to you is that six of the seven questions came out being statistically significant, relative to agreement and strong agreement, 
And they were also, they showed evidence of practical significance as well. So we were really excited about that. And as you can see, the statistical um, data that is, that is there, you can see this evidenced as well. So the only thing that did not show being a, a significant is simply that they didn't get it that we were using a variety of techniques to do this. But everything else they really got. They got that all students were respected in the classroom. They felt that. They felt that their instructor encouraged them to think outside the box, to think about these issues in a very critical way, a thoughtful way. Some other things that um, they were really encouraged uh, to talk about the complexities of these different issues, that they uh, were uh, encouraged to incorporate them in a variety of ways, uh, that they felt supported in this evidence, all right, and that diversity was valued. So again, it just further reiterated that the intentionality and doing this in the classroom is a very positive thing. Relative to then um, the open-ended questions, we wanted to see examples because none of us were really totally trusting the, the Likert scale questions, so we wanted to back it up with, all right, can you name specific examples where you saw this occurring? And so you can read those <coughs> various questions that we created. So what I want to uh, share with you and just have you think about this is that in the pre-survey, the responses that we got, we sort of expected, right? That students would say, this is what we do in classes. We have writing uh, assignments. We have research projects, because everybody does that, right? We do group work. We have discussion groups. But then in the post-survey, what caught our attention was the thoughtfulness that you start to appear. So you see an actual change in words. So research projects are presentations or reading, but reflective writing, okay? Critical self-reflection. These are the words they start to use. Increased knowledge or awareness. Immersion experiences, right? Um, attendance at diversity events. Rules for respect and group activities. Increased cultural awareness. So I think there's more, at least, an in, in intentionality about this and more thoughtful approach that you start to see, more tolerance as well. And those are things that, that really pleased us. So where are we going now? We want to drill down even more. And so this April, we will be um, hosting, working with the Applied Research Center. They will host for us four groups, uh, relative focus groups, these will represent students from each of the classes. There are seven members, seven faculty members of this particular cohort. So we feel that we'll really be able to um, get to the core of this and find out what's happening in the classroom and, and really learn where students getting this. Thank you so much. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Virginia. Good morning. I'm never quite sure what time of day it is these days, so I'm just checking myself there. Um, my name's Virginia Lee, as uh, Renee has uh, already said. I teach the Multiculturalism Dialogue and Field Experience course to all of the graduates and undergraduates in the School of Education at um, UW Stout. So I have a very broad uh, experience uh, teaching students in, uh, in that particular discipline. However, the course has just been made a GE course, uh, and so now we're beginning to get students from across campus, which is a, a, another very interesting experience and a challenge because the course is so, so much based in, in education. Um, my role here is to talk a little bit, um, have I moved it on? Yes. A little bit about the pedagogy or teaching methods um, that we encourage in the project and the cultural context of this pedagogy. So I don't want to get too theoretical, but I'm afraid in the um, uh, space of time that we've got here, this might be a little bit like that, and then of course it's going to be followed up by some more practical and, and very um, 
uh, inspirational uh, um, projects that my two colleagues have done. Of course, I do my own projects, but I'm not going to talk about them today. Uh, first of all, the cultural context. Um, during our first meeting, as Renee said, with the faculty, uh, we explored the meaning of cultural in gen culture in general. And by the way, I, I do have a cheat sheet here because I've got to try and keep on task here. Uh, of culture in higher education and the ways in which culture, as the kind of webs that we live and work in, lends itself both to conservatism, so maintaining those entrenched experiences that are part of the higher education culture, and innovation, the kind of possibility that we can use culture to transform our lives. We've got those two things going on, those two tensions. We talked to them also about the issue of power and how culture can actually dupe us into believing and acting in ways that may not be of interest to our, some of our students at least and maintain the status quo. We talked about how culture is a source of ideas that, and, and we can become agents, in fact, in social change. We shared the iceberg model, which I share with you here. Um, I think it's very well known to some of you here, but it's a very helpful way of understanding culture that which we see and hear, and that which uh, operates at a much deeper level, the level of attitudes and the level of beliefs and values. Uh, last year, we introduced the concept of hegemony, which is related to this notion of productive uh, reproduction, which some of you here may be in the field of social science, and, and this is something that you work with as well. Um, so we added it to this model here. You see in the top right-hand corner, hegemony, mechanisms of power that operate in the academy. Um, and we wanted to add this, uh, as Renee was suggesting, as part of our project of going deeper with our faculty. And, and you can see that during these three years of the project, we ourselves have been growing and going deeper in our understanding of what's necessary. This doesn't happen overnight. This is a, 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 a sort of an, a, an animal, if you like, that grows with us and becomes more meaningful. Uh, so we added the, uh, an exploration of certain cultural practices like standardization, categorization, individualization, and surveillance which we consider, sort of borrowing from Foucault, those of you who know Foucault's work, which we consider to be very important mechanisms of power that operate in the academy and that we've got to pay attention to if we want our project to be successful in the long run. So while standardization and categorization per se are perfectly fine ideas in terms of practice, they can be manipulated to reproduce practices that don't work for all of our students. They're not fully inclusive, or can, may, maybe aren't fully inclusive. The thing is that we all participate in this system, all of us, and certainly uh, I uh, include myself, and many of us are just convinced that that's the way things are. It's just normal and natural and common sense, and we have to be aware that if a project like this is going to be successful, we can't think like that. We've got to look at all of the factors. Uh, we defined hegemony with our faculty and we shared information. Uh, this is our, one of our definitions here. Uh, we shared information uh, about the ways in which uh, we all um, uh, the different kinds of projects that can uh, um, further equity and inclusion. One of these projects is the Hegemony Project, which um, uh, Renee mentioned earlier, which uh, actually I direct. Uh, I work with uh, a staff member, Dang Yang, and two uh, students, a graduate and undergraduate student. We have a website, which I invite you to go to. Uh, I think we're doing some very interesting work. As Renee said, what we're trying to do is to find out from students the ways in which hegemony, the barriers to education are operating in their academic lives. They're telling us stuff that we don't know. But to get to that information is very difficult. So we, that's where we developed the collage project. So we invited them with certain prompts that we gave them, certain prompts that they came up with, to develop collage, to go deep down so that they could recognize some of these barriers on a very visceral level. 
the, the thing about it is that very often at the university, we conform to the expectations of the so-called professional environment, the culture of higher education, and we don't really express that which is deeper seated, that's very meaningful to us. That's what we wanted to get at. So we'll be doing a lot of dissemination of our ideas in the future, but that's what we use with our faculty here as well, the collage project. So that's the major goal in many ways of our uh, okay. major goal of our infusing diversity project really is to find out what is in the way of successful experience in higher education for all of our students. Then the pedagogy. How am I doing for time? It's all right. Um, the uh, pedagogy that we used was very much based in the pedagogy that Holly Teuber, myself, and Renee actually use in our classrooms. But again, we grew in interaction with each other and in interaction with the marvelous faculty that uh, worked with us. Um, we used a range of, or suggested a range of pedagogical ideas and curricula to the faculty during that first meeting. Uh, they included uh, encouraging student voice and dialogue. Um, I think that was on the first one here. Uh, community, a developing community, critical consciousness, and praxis. And again, praxis is this, how many of you are Frarian folks, right? Praxis is this wonderful idea of being aware of this deep-seated uh, um, and embodied, if you like, um, um, biases that we all have. So that actually, we're actually practicing in the field in our classrooms we recognize when we cross uh, a, a line to actually imposing biases on our students and pull back at that point. So we're actually making changes in our practice as we're practicing it. So we've got to be very aware of what's going on with us so that we don't reproduce uh, um, behaviors that are going to be negative to our students. I hope that makes sense. Um, then we also introduced the notion of culturally responsive and problem-posing problem teacher practice, giving access to all students by developing curricula that build on the students' cultural norms, their values and interests, and helping them to see that they're actually learning academic tools to solve the problems and reach the goals that are meaningful to them in their lives. In other words, what we do at the academy is not an end in itself. We are providing tools that will help our students to move forward uh, with the goals that they have, the goals that others have for them, and hopefully in a very innovative, transformative way to be agents in their communities to create a more equitable and inclusive environment, society in general. Uh, we en encourage then students to see our assessment, this is my last slide here, assessment also as a learning tool. Formative assessment um, is a pedagogical tool engaging students in their own assessment, debating, developing creative ideas like the video and the game that we, Renee, already talked about, and methodologies like the collage and the metaphor project. Uh, so that was just the introduction in the first bit, and then I'm going to come back later and talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we experienced. Thank you. What we'd like to do now is to give you some very applied uh, examples of how we brought this, how we infused and transformed some of our courses. The first one who's going to speak is, is Arthur Neelan. He is a biologist. You will see he is full of passion and energy and enthusiasm for what he teaches, and he has found a very, very creative way to infuse diversity into biology. What is significant about this was that in the first cohort, we had um, uh, two biologists, or, or at least two from the science program, and they really wrestled. They, they couldn't initially see how in the world they could include um, diversity and multiculturalism into their class. They ended up doing fabulous projects. In fact, I believe that um, Polly um, Hashmi is part of the digital story, and so you got to hear a little bit of her story and they've just done amazing things. So, we'd like to introduce Arthur Neelan. Hello, my name is Arthur Neelan. I participated in the Infusing Diversity in the Classroom program in 2012 and 2013. 
The course that I teach is called Plants and People, and it's an exploration of how human cultures use plants to adapt to various situations on our planet. The course over the previous year had been uh, linked with anthropology components, and so culture was already a big portion of the course. Uh, my colleague and I, Dr. Mandy Little, thought that, that this was a natural progression for the course. And so Dr. Little had already undergone the diversity program in the previous year and had developed a set of rubrics and a set of pre-post assessments for the course uh, that were very beneficial. And so when I started the Infusing Diversity into the Curriculum program, I was already building on a really strong foundation in the course that I have. And so throughout the beginning of the Infusing Diversity program, I came up with five discussion and course modules that would allow me to infuse diversity concepts throughout the interactive discussion periods that we have in this course. I'll go over those briefly. Um, and so what we started with was a um, course module uh, where we try to explore plants in their culture. Uh, the goal of this module was first to get students to understand that A, they have a culture. Um, being a largely Midwestern uh, group of students, they oftentimes don't recognize that they have a culture. And so exploring how they specifically use plants as an adaptation was a way to start to put them into the context of uh, diversity and cultures. The second uh, course module that we had was a discussion model. Uh, this discussion uh, revolved around culture and gender. And so um, we started by reading a, a paper on uh, the chimpanzee bonobo, um, their culture, and how they uh, use sex in their culture to begin the discussion of gender and how different cultures form gender. Um, it was a very difficult discussion at times, um, being that it is a somewhat loaded topic. But in the, at the end result of the discussion, we did uh, at least get to the awareness of uh, the various gender stereotypes that we all carry within ourselves. Uh, the next discussion component that we had was where I had the students go out and uh, find a news article to bring into class. They had to read the news article and look for cultural components within the news article, and then come into class ready to discuss those, uh, both the news that they were looking at, how it affects their world, and also the cultural context that are conveyed within the news article. We then did a, a session where we talked about the various medicinal cultures that humans have across the world. I chose the... Um, the four uh, main medicinal cultures that I'm aware of, uh, Western medicine, Eastern medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, and shamanistic medicine. And we did a project where they had a piece of paper and they had to actually diagram their own thoughts on health and wellness, what components uh, from medicine go into creating a healthy person. And finally, uh, we had an essay where they had to reflect on cultural awareness um, and how having a greater understanding of culture can be a positive for them in the future. As I said previously, Dr. Mandy Little had uh, created an evaluation for the course that was very good and worked to understand their growing knowledge of uh, diversity when I actually got into the classroom and uh, was, was bringing my, my uh, lecture and discussion um, modules that I had created to the students, um, some of them went better than others. Uh, the, as I previously mentioned, the students don't often have uh, even the vaguest awareness that they have their own culture. Uh, it became very clear quickly that um, what students think of as culture is, uh, you know, uh, drinking fancy tea and coffee or, uh, you know, French cheese, etc. Uh, they, they don't um, take culture into something that, that all humans have and all humans use uh, to 
to uh, interact with their world. Um, this experience of uh, things not going exactly right in the classroom um, was actually one of the most valuable of this project because it has been a very strong guiding force for how I develop my curriculum into the future. And so uh, that example of students being unaware of their culture means that I spend more time on that aspect uh, now and really um, dig into what culture means before I have the students start exploring their own culture. Uh, some of the other project uh, items that came up when we, for instance, talked about gender roles, I had a, a wide range of student responses to the discussion of gender roles and what purpose they serve in society, uh, ranging from, from people who uh, were very thrilled at the changes that we've had in gender roles in terms of women's liberation or um, homosexual rights, uh, ranging to people who uh, thought that gender roles were, were an important piece of the fabric of their personal society and were talking about their grandparents' lives and their parents' lives and how those gender roles shaped who they are today to people who were um, who thought that the changing gender roles were a very negative thing in society. And so it was, it was uh, you know, both, both very uh, empowering to, to see, but also um, in some ways shocking for me as a, a person who, who believes that you know, greater rights and awareness for everybody is a good thing, to see the, the negative impact that, um, that this sort of opening up has had on some, some cultures and groups. When we went to go look at the news articles uh, for, for the What's in the News um, class component, uh, I, I ran into some very uh, difficult stumbling blocks um, in that uh, students have a very hard time analyzing cultural context of a news story that they're members of. Um, and so I had specifically asked them to explore news articles that were pertinent to them. And so, so they were looking at a news article that was a part of their culture oftentimes. And it, that ran into that, that um, problem of the students not necessarily being able to um, see their own culture fully. And so again, I will modify this in the future where I will start with prepping the students and showing them a couple examples of cultural context in news um, so that they can then go off on their own and explore this. When we talked about the cultures of health, uh, it was very interesting to find uh, that on the surface there was this great diversity of ways that people looked at health. Um, you know, there was a, a lot of Ayurvedic concepts that, that were brought into health um, in terms of the uh, what foods you eat uh, formulate your health. Um, also, a lot of the ideas uh, from Eastern medicine of uh, you know uh, these uh, eating eating various plants and and things to make you healthier, or uh, the stretching exercises that we have become more common in our society in the form of of yogic practice. Uh, so seeing this very superficial, wide diversity of, of health issues, but then at the core, uh, they, they were oftentimes very Western in their approach of, uh, you know, when I'm really sick, I go to the doctor. Um, we, in the assessment, uh, some of the uh, topics that came up that I had the most success with um, you know, sort of as an endpoint analysis of the course, uh, we asked a, asked a question at the beginning of the semester, uh, how they feel about this issue, and then they would rate it on a scale of one to five, and at the end of the semester, and so uh, some of the, the important shifts in perspective that I did achieve over the semester um, were two questions like, the rights of people in other countries are of little importance to me, or contributions to scientific knowledge come primarily from developed Western countries, or I'm aware of injustices that different groups experience in the world. 
These questions show that the students did have a significant shift in their perspective uh, to being um, more aware of the plight of people in other places and uh, going from a world where uh, the, their, their home is the center to a world where there's so much going on. Um, other things that we had significant results for was uh, I often feel irritated by people from other countries had a, a, a reduction. Um, my everyday activities have an impact on people located on other continents. So starting to understand that whole globalized uh, nature of the world and that um, the dominant role that our culture has in economics, for instance, can have a very debilitating impact on people in other places. And uh, the people who are cause causing global environmental problems suffer more consequences than those who are not causing the problems. Uh, so shifting from the idea that, that you know, we all suffer from the from global environmental crisis to understanding the idea that it's actually more impoverished people who suffer from the uh, global environmental crisis than the, the very wealthy. In summary, I think that uh, the infusing diversity into the curriculum is a very good model for improving an already existing course, for taking these diversity concepts that are so important and plugging them into a course material. I think that the, the technique of first educating the teachers about the diversity issues, so bringing everybody up to the, to the same level, um, so that we can then sit around at a table and have good discussions about how we're going to actually go into our classroom and talk about these complicated issues. I also think that, that this kind of a program is extremely important on a university-wide level. Uh, because it takes diversity awareness and diversity education and it makes it more than just a goal on a vision and change document or, or, or uh, someplace on a website. It makes it something that we're actually putting into our everyday life and trying to make a difference with. I don't stand up in front of these things. Um, I don't think I've ever seen Arthur wear a tie before. And I'm, my guess is he had it off within about three minutes or three seconds as soon as he was done. My name is Mark Fenton. Um, as as uh, Dr. Howerton said, what I do at Stout is um, I teach courses in uh, international business, international management. I'm also the business administration program director at Stout, which means um, including the one seven-year-old son that I have, I have another 700 children that I have to work with, which is fine. I enjoy what I do. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the project that I worked on. I, my focus is on cross-cultural understanding in terms of living and working and understanding why people behave and act the way they do in other countries. I've been to 30 different countries uh, across the globe, uh, which is more than the number of states that I've been to in the United States. And frankly, there's some states I have no desire to go to anyways, so it worked out pretty well, pretty well for me. So let's talk a little bit about my, pro my project. Uh, you know, my American students, uh, they needed to essentially under develop a sense of understanding of why uh, it's important to understand something about culture in other countries. And so one of the first things they had to do is they had to identify those barriers to culture. And when you think about America, for the most, most part of our history, we've, we, you know, we, we've, we've been isolated. And to an extent, we still are. We've got this one big body of water on one side, another big body of water on the other side. And we really haven't had the need to go learn something about somebody else in some other country. Well, with trade agreements and e the ease of travel, the internet, all kinds of things, um, it's become much more important. My classes almost always, no, not almost, they always have students from, from other countries. Uh, I work very closely with, with our Office of International, International Education, and they know that I really want those international students in my class, because I want my American students to have some interaction with those, with those folks, and so we try to break down some of those barriers. One of the things that the students have to do is they have to identify what are some of the unique qualities about other cultures. And I'll talk a little bit about how that, how that takes place. Um, what are some of the things that we did? We did name stories, and maybe some of you are familiar with name stories. Somebody has to figure out, okay, you know, not, you know what, what is essentially the heritage of their name? Like my last name is Fenton, and that's from Ireland. And 
So I got you know Irish in me, and that's from my dad's side, but my mom had a whole hodgepodge of stuff, and, and I still don't pretend to understand that part of it. But that was at least something, and they didn't, did not do very good at, at the name games, because um, I, I put them on the spot. I didn't give them time to think about it. I said, well, what, what's your heritage? Well, I'm German. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. Maybe I like bratwurst or something uh, along that line. Um, one of the first things we did is, as the project started in my class, I did a cultural pretest, and it was, it was um, a very interesting pretest. I'll talk about some stats with that. We had weekly discussions of topics related to culture. Some of them were uncomfortable to talk about, um, and including the role of women, uh, race, uh, religion, uh, from a, from a cross-cultural standpoint. Um, I think one of the best parts of the whole project was the students all had to do interviews, at least two people from different countries. Now, they didn't do them one after the other one. They did one, they posted a reflection, um, a, a review and a reflection, and then all the students in the class read those reviews and reflections, and then they had to post a reflection of what they got out of from reading all, reading all of those. And we did a post-test on international orientation towards the end of the course. So what the, the pre and post weren't identical, um, but it, it certainly gave me some, some pretty good uh, data to work from. Um, in terms of assessment, there's that pre-test and post-test, and then the, the, the uh, surveys that, uh, that Renee had talked about earlier, my students took at the beginning and again at the end of the, end of the course, end of the project. What are my outcomes? Well, with the pre-test, uh, uh, on average, the, the, uh, it was 36% out of the 29 questions, 36% correct, and that number is skewed because my international students did a much better job than my American students. And um, so if, if I factored out my, my, that out, it'd probably be closer to about 18%, um, which means that my American students really had a lot to learn. Uh, and, and frankly, I believe so do I. At the beginning of, each, at the, beginning of the project, and actually as I've continued with this project on my own. I always talk to my international students ahead of time. I ask them if they're willing to share something about their culture and uh, if they don't mind if I put them on the spot once in a while. And even if they say, even if they say no, I still do it anyway, so it doesn't make a difference. Um, with the, uh, the full reflection uh, of the interviews and, the, re and the, the review of the reflections, 20, uh, 23 of the 25 students really um, thought that it made a, a significant impact on their learning about cross-cultural understanding. And, uh, and how people be, uh, behave and act in other countries. The post-test, so what is international orientation post-test? And I think it's important to note that this was developed by Paula Caligari, and at the time she was at Rutgers University, now she's at Northeastern in University in, uh, in, in Boston. And um, she, she's definitely a, uh, a well-known guru in this, in this field. Uh, she had this, uh, developed a, a Likert scale associated with this, looking at different cultural dimensions, and, and um, I'll make I'll make this, uh, both of these pre and post tests available to you uh, through David, and um, uh, very welcome to, to, uh, to use those or take a look at them. Student reflections, as I said, showed a significant improvement. I think that's really is one of the key things in, in, uh, in terms of I got from the, from the pre-test to the post-test. My American students still weren't perfect, and I didn't expect them to be, but there was definitely an enhanced knowledge and understanding of, of the why they should at least study. Uh, other cultures. Um, my American students and the international students found to be a positive experience. One of the interesting things for the international students, when they did their interviews, they, I told them you can only interview one American. So they had to interview another international student not from their country. And, and that kind of got them out of their comfort zone. I think that was one of the key things about the whole project for me and for my students is getting a little bit out of their comfort zone. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. So what's next? Well, I did the project again last fall, and it was okay, but last fall it was a little more difficult for me to get my students to open up. It was a kind of a quiet class that meets one day a week and for, for, uh, for uh, uh, three hours, and I had um, an unusually high number of students from Saudi Arabia, and they are relatively quiet in class. And it's hard to get them to, to open up. So it, it didn't go quite as well as I would like it to. This semester, I got a real lively bunch. I got students from China, I got students from the United Kingdom, I got students uh, from, from two, uh, three, three other countries in that class. And, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a blast so far. And uh, I'm looking forward to some really interesting work in the long run. I'm w developing a sort of a larger set for data analysis as part of the continuing project. And I'm, right now, I'm also working to get access to probably one of the, the best 
tools for measuring somebody's cross-cultural adaptability. And it's a CCEI, cross-cultural adaptability inventory. Um, and use that as a pre and post test. I believe it's a 59 question inventory, but it's also proprietary. And so I have to get permission uh, from the uh, copyright owners. And uh, they make a lot of money with the CCAI. So I have to uh, uh, beg and grovel a little bit bef uh, before I can start using, using that one. What did I learn about myself? Well, one of, my, one of the biggest problems that I have, and, I, and still something I'm struggling with, is the under, uh, understanding and actually really more or less discussing the role of women in other countries. You think about Saudi Arabia, you know, the, the women finally got the right to vote in Saudi Arabia just recently. Um, in Japan, women more or less, uh, they, they don't see a lot of women in executive positions, have very traditional jobs. Um, in other countries, uh, you know, you, you, uh, if, you're, if you're a man, you don't, t you don't touch a woman. And I have to explain these things in my international management class, because it's a key thing, because some of these students are going to be living and working in other countries, and they have to understand this. And so being, being a, a white man, it's kind of difficult for me to, to address these issues when over half the students every semester in the class are women, but it has to be covered. Um, it's been able to help me identify some of my cultural biases. We all have them. Some of them are very innate within us. We don't, just don't recognize them. What did I learn about my students? Well, as I said before, ge ge geographically we're isolated. And I've been really trying to focus on that and tell, to essentially get them out of their, out of their um, out of their comfort zone. You don't have to leave the country. You know, you're at a university. A university, by its very nature, is definitely a diverse place to be. My students, uh, I've, it's, it's an upper level class. They have a serious desire to learn, a serious desire to reflect and apply what, what they've learned as a result of doing the project. And they wanted to know more, and that's the part that made me happy. Um, and, and they continue to want to know more. I've got a feeling my dad, by, for the, by the end of the semester, um, it's, it's probably going to blow me out of the water based on just how the conversation has been going so far. What did I learn about teaching and diversity-based uh, concepts? It takes a conscious effort. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. You have to plan your way through the project. You have to be dynamic. In other words, you have to be willing to change a little bit of, how you, of, of, of your, your approach. Things don't always go perfectly. And there are multiple approaches, and, and they are appreciated. And as, as Dr. Howerton has said, students didn't necessarily realize the multiple approaches that were being taken. And I don't think that's such a bad thing. It's just part of, that, part of how the corpus and project worked out. And do your project on a regular basis. And, and again, make it a dynamic project. Make it a growing project. Um, and, and give it the opportunity to e become even better either every year or every semester, however long you do it. Uh, keep your data for analysis. I think that it's critical, and I think it helps you track things in the long run. And as I said before, get out of your comfort zone. You know, one of the things for like Americans, we like to have arm's length for our comfort zone. In many countries, people talk to you like this. They're right in front of you. And so I could come right up here and I could talk to you. Do you feel uncomfortable right now? A little bit. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> so get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone. And you don't have to leave the classroom, but I certainly would like to encourage you to leave the classroom. Um, you know, it's sometimes it's not always possible. And finally, I think one of the key things for anything that you do is you have to find a way to have some fun with it. That's part of walking over there and getting in somebody's face. I do that in my class, and it's a blast. I love doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Inusa Bubakar. So I'm uh, one of the participants of this year cohorts on uh, including diversity into our curriculum. This is a still ongoing project. It's not completed yet, so I don't have the completed result yet. Uh, but we know maybe what we are doing. So. Uh, the title of this project is uh, to look at uh, intentions and our own prejudice because we all have them and we don't know about them until maybe somebody else pointed out to you, oh, this is what's going on, and then you start to realize, oh, yeah, that's true. So this is what we are trying to learn from this project. How are we going to do it? 
it has two components. Uh, I am not working alone on this. I'm working with uh, two of my uh, colleagues. Uh, one of them uh, teaches uh, economics, just like me, I teach economics. And the other one uh, teaches uh, political science. So in our, <coughs> we look at our uh, intro to American government class, and then uh, principles of economic class. And the second uh, component of the project will uh, be conducted on a university-wide uh, survey. We are not going to survey only our students, but um, about maybe 2,000 or 3,000 students at UW Stout. And we're gonna compare the results <coughs> towards the end of the uh, semester. So in our uh, principles of economic classes, uh, we intentionally decided to talk about diversity and this is how we said, okay, this is how we're gonna do it. Uh, we are going to uh, make use of in-class activities, in-class experiments, show them, for example, here, uh, looking at this uh, topic of economic inequality, we are going to look at the income inequalities, um, political inequality, and then inequality of um, opportunity, how that will impact our life their lives, the lives of other people, looking at these components of uh, inequality and then learn why we are kind of not at ease when we see uh, inequality, economic inequality because of this and this can have a far reaching impact on our lives. And then also we are going to use, because it's not easy for example for me to go and talk to uh, students, 99% uh, who, kind of look, doesn't look like me, or sound like me, or stuff like that, talk to them about diversity. So uh, for me to be able to do it, I'm gonna have to get things like this discussion starter of diversity, instead of me saying, okay, you need to accept people who don't look like you, or you need to accept people who don't sound like you. I start with a uh, discussion uh, about diversity. This is, for example, a discussion starter about this poem here, somebody who never saw a, an ego, and then the first time he saw the ego, he said, this is an ugly creature, and decided to transform the ego, make the ego look like a beautiful creature, per his own definition of beauty. But he doesn't know that what he was about to do to the ego <laughs> will be detrimental to the life of that ego. But because he didn't know, he went and, went and did it. So after reading this poem, I asked the student to read it, one of the students in the class, and then we asked questions. And two of those questions are here, for example. Uh, ask them how they feel about it, and try to relate it to the history of United States and how they feel about it. So then that will bring them to open up, and then they're gonna start to ask questions. Yeah, this is wrong, this is wrong, and then maybe we can uh, lead to the point where they may think, oh, yeah, I tried to do it once also, or once somebody tried to do it to me or something like that, and ask them how they feel about it. So this is one of the discussion started that we do. Instead of me talking to them about, this is how you should accept people who don't kind of look like you or sound like you, they read it through here. Now, uh, in American government class, uh, she said she, incorporate diversity in different components of the class, through lecture, through in-class activity, through exams. And the assessment that she uses is content analysis uh, to evaluate whether or not she achieved her goals. Now, uh, the second component of this project will be a university-wide survey. The objective here is for us to explain students' level of tolerance in terms of their personal background, family backgrounds, socio-political economic views, and also the degree of exposure to diversity. We have different questions for each team, and we're gonna send this survey out towards the end of this semester. Not to our students only, but also to other students. And we're gonna use our students as treatment groups, because they have been exposed to the concept of diversity, and the rest of the students will serve as um, control group. 
So instead of doing pre and post, we are going to do control and uh, treatment group. And we expect this will lead also to the same uh, results just as pre and post uh, assessments. And we are going to make use of uh, statistical analysis of a difference in difference, something that we can also do with uh, pre and post. We can also do it here with control and uh, how we call it, a treatment group. Um, okay, so this is mine. Uh, again, like I said, we don't have the result yet. We intend to send the survey out towards the end of the semester because we are going to incorporate diversity into our classes throughout the semester. And then at the end of the semester, that is when we're going to ask them these survey questions. And also, we're going to put them at the same level as the rest of the students. So that is why we didn't send the survey out. We are waiting until the end of the semester, which is in the next uh, few weeks or so. So hopefully, uh, we'll be able to uh, come up with uh, an explanation as to why probably we are tolerant or we are not. And the tolerance question here doesn't only apply to the classroom setting. Uh, it applies to uh, the place of uh, work, where they work, if they feel comfortable working with somebody who doesn't sound, look, or doesn't come from the same country as they do, and also at home how they feel about their neighbors, who are not the same as they are. Uh, and unfortunately enough, this semester I have, uh, in one of my class, I guess, one third of the students are international students. They come from abroad, uh, Saudi Arabia, China, uh, Japan, UK. So we are able to have a frank discussion with all of the students in the class. And uh, the way I do it is I try to open up, let them see me as a person, not just somebody who kind of uh, try to impose his view on them, but I want them to be able to open up. And so far, we have been successful. They, they open up, they talk, we talk. We talk about gender issues, race issues, income issues in the United States, and also in the rest of the world. And uh, my own also experience, I spent more than half of my time studying uh, abroad outside of my native country. So I am uh, kind of uh, familiar with those kind of issues as well. And I'm willing to share with my students. How am I doing with the time? Oh, I can wrap it up. Yeah, so uh, the, <laughs> the objective here is for us to send this survey out to about 2,000, 3,000 students, and then from then conduct uh, statistical analysis and I will be more than happy to share the results with you once we get them. Thank you. Excuse me. You can see why it is such a joy to work with, with faculty members like this because of their infectious enthusiasm, right? All right. What we're going to uh, now do is I'm going to have you talk, okay? Um, but before I get into that, I want to stress something. You heard it, but I want to make sure you got it. And that is that if you're sitting there and you're saying, there's no way I could do a full semester uh, number of activities, I want you to know that some of the, the participants only took one unit or one topic and created a significant activity or assignment project associated with that versus some where they did multiple activities and they spread it throughout the, the entire semester or entire year. And as you heard from Mark Fenton, some of them continue to do that research as well. So you have a lot of options here. Uh, don't let that stop you or your colleagues from jumping in and doing this. All right.